Welcome to our social media virtual roundtable. Um, today we'll be discussing how the pandemic has affected the use of social media, including strategy, crisis management and conversions. Um, so we've got a very good panel joining us today. We've got Paul Meller, who is the founder of Meller & Smith, which is a brand and advertising agency. There he is. Uh, we've also got Catherine Wright, who is the CEO of Discount Vouchers, um, who provide daily deals from everything from Disney to DIY. And we've got Katrina Kachansky, who is the founder of AKA Communications, um, an agency for the food and hospitality industry, and she's also a whiz on crisis management. So, hi everybody. Um, how are we all doing? How are we all finding working from home during the pandemic, how are we finding it? Paul, I know you've been homeschooling as well as working. How are you finding that? Um, it's all right. I mean, I live in France now, so uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit easier than being in London. Um, so yes, yeah, so I live in the Alps, uh, which means that I've actually been able to get out as opposed to being cooped up in, um, you know, in a two bed flat in, uh, in London. But yeah, it's, pretty, it's, it's been all right. I mean, we've got, we've got clients in all different, um, various states of uh crisis <laughs> some less crisis than others but yeah <laughs> it's it's been it's been interesting brilliant and Catherine how about yourself uh, so uh, when we originally moved the business back to Norwich from London years ago everybody worked from home um and then we decided we were going to get an office and share it so for us it's a little bit of a return to normal um we haven't furloughed anybody and uh, yeah, so everybody's just working from home, using the usual tools to communicate and um, playing some fun, fun uh, card games uh, like Cards of Humanity and things on our weekly quizzes just to keep everybody's spirits up. And yeah, it's, it's not been too bad, but I think we'll all be pleased when we can be back in the office and talking together and coming up with loads of interesting ideas together again. Brilliant. And how about yourself, Katrina? Um, well, I mean, benefits apart from, you know, being a complete technophobe with no uh, <laughs> IT support, but no, I mean, um, there are definitely benefits that um, I'm going to be taking and, you know, transferring into my working life when we're out of lockdown, for example, obviously working in hospitality, most of my clients are based in restaurants and bars um, all over London, if not the UK. So there are days regularly when, you know, I was going to between six to eight meetings in different parts of London and then I wondered why I was a you know uh not getting as much done in the office as I would like and be usually a kind of broken shell of a human being by the end of the working day so you know there have definitely been some benefits to um to this whole process yeah brilliant um okay well let, we'll get started into some of the discussion points that we have um and some of you who are watching may have already taken part in our social media survey regarding the pandemic um, so 50% of those respondents have actually said that they're posting more content onto social media. Um, and this is an open question for all of the panelists. Is this a trend that you are seeing for yourself across your different industries? And do you think this is something that's going to continue after the pandemic? Um, I don't know who wants to go first, maybe Paul? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all, uh, my, my answer to, questions like this is it's always, um, it should be strategy before tactics. And so if we're thinking about, um, should someone be posting more or have I seen more of that? Is that a good idea? That feels very tactic-y and not so much a strategy. You know, have I decided what I'm trying to achieve or not? Um, I, the other thing that I think when it comes to social media and, and if, uh, and there's, there's definitely an increase in traffic. I mean, you, 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 you know, you really can see that, but, uh, in, both in terms of people posting and people um, just engagement in general is that just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean that you should be doing it um, why should you, and also you know you should you know I, I run a, an ad agency that does the opposite to everybody else so my advice to anybody is when everyone's doing something you should be doing the opposite to everybody else so if everyone if every brand every one of your competitors is posting on social media you know 20 posts a day and they're spamming the hell out of people then do the opposite to that um, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of my sort of broad top line view when it comes to uh, the frequency um, or not of uh, people posting or brands posting on social. 
And Katrina, with, with the food and hospitality industry, obviously taking a bit of a hit at the moment. How is yeah. that like in your industry? Yeah, I mean, um, I kind of take it, I don't think anybody should be spamming people 20 times a day. Um, what I would say is that, um, you know, having lost our, our venues and a lot of places having, they've lost their revenue, they've lost their customers. Um, social media at the moment has become a really vital and important tool for communicating, you know, whether it's, that they're launching a, a um, delivery service, whether it's just to help campaign for this national timeout um, where we're calling for all landlords to stop, um, to, to um, not charge any rent for nine months so that, you know, when, when we do eventually get back, um, you know, the hospitality people won't be crippled by these ridiculous rents that often um, London landlords charge. Um, so, you know, we're doing a Save Soho campaign, which again, we're launching on social. So, yeah, I think um, whilst nobody wants to be, you know, bombarded with by this, um, I do think this crisis, if we hadn't had social media, would have been a lot more horrific than it has been. It's really brought us all together as a, you know, as a community. Brilliant. And Catherine, because your business is primarily, well, it's pretty much online, how are you finding the pandemic affecting the civil side of things? Yeah, so um, initially in March, I think everybody just took a deep breath inwards and, you know, obviously lots of the travel merchants that we have who had um, lots of exposure booked in with us have had to delay all of that. Um, but what we've seen is a bit of a polarizing effect. So a lot of the really large companies have furloughed a lot of their staff and most of those, I think, seem to be on the marketing team just by their kind of general lack of response. And what we've seen is a lot of smaller companies have really kind of moved into that space and made a bit of a land grab in this time, I think. Um, and certainly the, the you know, Instagram stories with um, Shop Local on there as well. That, so that's where I've seen a lot more posting is from a lot of the smaller local businesses mm -hmm. who have been able to continue to work because they're, you know, perhaps they're much smaller, it's much easier for them to socially distance or perhaps they, they drop ship. Um, so, and, and I think that's where we've seen the main difference, but it's, it's generally been good for us because people are in front of their um, computers a bit more, um, opening their emails a bit more. But on the flip side of that, there's, you know, that it's the attention has really been concentrated with uh, some of the larger merchants, you know, into places where they they just don't need the traffic. So in in terms of affiliate, the relationship has changed there a little bit as a lot of them turned off their affiliate programs. Um, but I think we're beginning to see world return to normal a little bit in that sense. And is that across the board, like as, as the sort of lockdown is loosening, you're starting to see sort of um, sort of flashes of life again from, from the companies that had originally kind of turned off straight away after the lockdown went down? Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of the subscription businesses, you know, just did, they didn't need any traffic. And I think they still don't. So that's things like magazines, children's art boxes, painting, bakery um, sets and things like that so those are still doing really well in their own right probably don't need any assistance with traffic um, and the same with plant retailers but I think what a lot of them found is they just couldn't keep up with the demand with being able to socially distance in their warehouses so um, it, it's that part of it that I think means that they've been able to go back to business normally you know just that they have found the workarounds now they've probably got some protective equipment so so that's meaning that they can go go back to work as they were before okay Brilliant. Um, you mentioned uh, sort of at the top of the at the top of the show. I was going to say that at the top oh, of the podcast <laughs> that you had created an agency based on you know doing the opposite of what the of what the I guess the general uh, public are doing, if you like, or the general sort of consensus is doing. In our survey, seventy five percent of respondents had said they'd not changed the tone or narrative of their communications during the crisis. Do you think? that's essential to do so during an event, even if you're, if you're suggesting to some of your clients do the opposite to what everybody else is doing? Well, it's, a tr it's um, every, uh, every brand is different, right? So, you know, what, what works for one doesn't work for another. So for example, one of our clients, Amazon, they're absolutely flying at the moment. Um, you know, they haven't really changed a great deal. And they don't need to. Um, and then we have other clients, we work with Expedia, where like, <laughs> Uh, the bot, their bottom has fallen out of their world. You know, like travel is completely uh, turned upside down. So everything is different. So it does depend on the, the brand and the industry and the situation they find themselves in. I do agree that we've already, what we've already been said, like the level of exposure is going to have a big bearing on some of those decisions as well. So that sort of taking that in context. Um, 
yeah, I think brands should be doing the opposite to what everyone else is doing. So, you know, I can't, I lost count of how many emails and I'm sure everyone got exactly the same, the amount of emails from CEOs, from brands that I didn't even know even had my email address <laughs> telling me how brilliant they were at um, managing their company and what they were doing to, um, to combat uh, the, the stresses that were put on their business by, um, by the pandemic. Just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean you should do that. Mm. Um, you know, the, 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 they take that into everything. Um, just, to, I mean, that's in terms of like that sort of pure uh, comms, that, uh, that example. But I mean, we've got clients of ours now that are um, advertising outdoor. You know, they get, the billboards are so cheap at the moment. I mean, it's ridiculous, like sort of 70, 80, 90% cheaper than they were three months ago. We've got clients booking a Piccadilly Circus, you know, the most famous uh, billboard in, in the UK. Uh, we've got clients booking TV, massive discounts. So these really big um, traditional mediums mm -hmm. that would normally be out of reach to a lot of brands um, suddenly come into reach uh, with some brands. I know we're supposed to be talking about social media, but actually when it comes to your marketing mix, you should be thinking about the whole gamut of what's available to you rather than just one channel. Um, and that's what I mean by doing the opposite to everybody else. Uh, you should be looking at how you can literally do the 180 degrees to everybody else. That's, for me, that's how advertising works. I run an ad agency. My job is to make my clients famous. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. So the, my, my method generally is to do the opposite to everybody else. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. How, how about anyone else? Does anyone have a differing uh, opinion to Paul on that? I wouldn't be surprised. Sorry, I, mean, I generally am the contrarian. <clears throat> no, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't say I've got a, oh, sorry, I wouldn't say I've got a diametrically opposite view. I kind of agree with what he was saying. I think actually this crisis has been, and I hate using the word unprecedented, but it's like nothing that anybody has ever seen before. And therefore for some clients, yes, it's business as usual. You know, I've got some drinks brands, sales are absolutely through the roof. Everyone's drinks trolleys are being loaded up. And, you know, we did Cinco de Mayo. Normally we team up with all the top bars and restaurants in London. Instead, we had influencers and lots of people. We had amazing print, print media covering it as well. We arranged deliveries of margarita kits at everyone's houses. So we've all adapted. Other people, yeah, there's been a complete, you know, you've had to completely pivot your business um, and change what you're doing. So I think it's been a really interesting mix. I, do, I don't disagree at all. I think you've just got to read the signs and deal with each client on a case-by-case -case basis. And yeah, try and stand out from the crowd as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that's where the, some of the smaller businesses have just been able to think more on their toes. They don't yeah. have these layers of decision yeah. makers that all of those things have to go through. So, yeah, I, I would agree Agreed. with that too. I mean, it's striking the tone of it has been difficult, you know, especially it, we're affiliates for companies selling some masks and gloves and things like that. And so, you know, of course, it could seem completely opportunistic to include some of those things. But at the same time, there are customers who definitely want to buy them. Um, so, you, you know, it's about kind of judging the tone right with, with yeah. the audience as well with those. Great. Well, thank you. I just wanted to co cover a couple of housekeeping things. So if you do have any questions uh, for our panel, do feel free to pop them in the box and we'll get those towards the end of the discussion. Um, and if you want to tweet about it, please use the hashtag CityWireVirtual and CityWireSocial. Um, so sort of moving on to kind of social media, you know, we've literally had a captive audience for kind of April and May. Um, how is that affecting conversions? Um, Catherine, I know that your, your website and your business is, you know, built on converting sales very, very quickly. How, you, how have you found that during the lockdown? Um, so I would say the time to conversion is about the same. We've seen an increase in um, like effective cost per click and an increase in average order value, um, which is interesting given that there are, you know, there's no travel and normally those kind of larger ticket items aren't on there. Um, but you know, people have got more time to browse, more time to shop. Of what we've seen is probably a drop off, you know, as you'd expect across fashion. And so at the moment, there are some amazing deals across. Um, some of the really kind of key fashion merchants uh, simply because lots of people are going to be ending up with kind of spring, summer, uh, seasonal, where that, you know, that they would normally have managed to sell by now and they'd be moving into the next season. So um, in terms of customers, I think there's more eyeballs, more interaction, uh, certainly across social media, I think more commenting, but not necessarily more conversions. 
Um, we're seeing a lot from email marketing and, and generally we see that as being incremental and then social media tends to, to add on to that and add to the messaging and the branding. Um, but overall, um, we haven't seen an increase in conversions from social. Okay, so you would say that social is kind of a sort of um, more of a, what's the word I'm trying to think of, like an add on to, to your email marketing. Yeah, and, and, kind and of very possibly. Yeah, very possibly. It's just because there, there are so many more people having that conversation in that space. And, you know, Facebook is always very clever when you have ads up. It knows which audiences are worth money. Um, and so, you know, you tend to find if you're going after an audience that everybody else is going after that, that actually your cost per click and cost per conversion, you know, increases as well. Does anyone else have anything to add on to conversions or email marketing and social media? I mean, well, what we've seen, I mean, I don't get necessarily involved in the, the that bottom end of the funnel, that, that real conversion. We're uh, an agency that concentrates at the top. But what I've seen with a number of our clients is um, the ones that are flying. Uh, so we work with a bike brand, um, yeah, quite a famous bike brand. And they like the <laughs> conversion is like, you know, record levels. You know, they, they, they just can't make the bikes quick enough. I mean, they've sold yeah. every bike they have. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it, it, the, it, that isn't necessarily their problem. And then, and then others, they are struggling to convert. So I think there is some uh, quite wide differences uh, depending on industry um, and okay. sector. And I think also price point, which is what you said as well, Catherine. You know, it's, I mean, it's, um, the, the, there are some differences there. But I also think creativity is, is, is going to be the key to any of these problems. You know, a good idea will will um outpace a bad idea so it, it comes down to your ability to outthink the competition um yes you need you need to have your um your marketing tech stack absolutely nailed down and and, and you, need, you need all of your fundamentals yes but actually it comes down to creativity can you outthink the competition um and and that that's that's been like that Yes, marketing has been like that since day one and it will continue to be like that. So that hasn't changed. Um, the ability to take market share of somebody else. So like uh, Catherine said, you know, these smaller brands um, on the high street, you know, they, um, if they pivoted, they've been sort of fleet of foot and they've been able to um, make a grab for market share. That's, that's really smart. You know, they've been able to outthink the competition. And I think that's, that's just going to continue. Um, as we at whatever stage we are in this in this kind of process have you got anything to add to that Katrina or I mean what are you finding with um I know you kind of touched upon it in the previous question but how are you finding it for I mean I guess the drinks is the main one that's converting well quite well you know it, yeah I was going to say it's kind of an interesting one for us because you know the kind of bottom dropped out of our industry so conversions aren't really like, yes, okay, we've got lots of influencers that we, for example, we work with Hackersan, we've delivered dim sum all over London to every top influencer who has then, you know, posted. And that has been amazing. Like, I, and definitely, you know, they've seen that, you know, they're now about to launch another, a, a new delivery um, brand, which I can't mention, I can't talk about, but anyway, it's very exciting. <laughs> um, and that is, you know, that has been to people um, delivering at home. And that's been great. The other thing is, you know, as, um, Catherine has touched on these smaller shops. Um, you know, the Notting Hill Fish Shop was just a, a fishmonger. He teamed up with a, a local, but well, an amazing butcher, H.G. Walter, a baker, and you know, the the stuff they put on social. I mean, it's not just that, but you know, there's a queue for an hour outside, and we he's been propelled during this crisis because no one's going to restaurants, but they want restaurant level quality. So he's like, we've just opened another place called the Supermarket of Dreams, and the branding of that is so amazing. It's this kind of neon pink squid. And everyone's sharing it on social and going, look at this, it's so cool. It's kind of like a sort of kitsch quickie mart meets crazy killer squid. And everyone's gone crazy for it. They've got, you know, they've got a thousand followers and they've only been open two days. The first day of which was spent with actually me and everybody else stacking the shelves. I mean, it's been so homegrown and exciting and wonderful to be part of. So yeah, that's kind of, yeah, as, as uh, Paul said, creativity um, has been the thing that's really shone through in this for me. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm going to have to check that out. It sounds so cool. It's so cool. Yeah, it supermarket does. of dreams. Yeah. I don't want to pan on the word supermarket, but check it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I think I, mean, I, listened, my phone. I listened to something right at the beginning of all of, all of this, um, a guy, I think his name's Dan Priestley, uh, spoke to, 
to one of the groups that I'm in and you know, he's saying as awful as it is, you know, a lot of companies are going to go bust and lots of people are going to lose their jobs. You know, when big trees are felled from the forest, that's when small shoots get the chance to, to show through. Um, and that has just kind of been in the back of my mind this whole time, you know, that as, as awful as it is, mm. that there is going to be opportunity comes out of this. And, uh, you know, we just hope that there are more winners than losers, basically. But I think in terms of the end customer, and I think that's what you're seeing on social is all the things that people have said, you know, that they want companies to think in a social. Oh, yeah. Catherine's muted yourself. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> um, I don't know where I got up to, but yes, yeah, so, so companies being, you know, with their corporate social responsibility, thinking green, you know, and, and giving back to the community. I think those things have all been forced right to the forefront and companies have been made to think about how they can, you know, match all of those and go forward and make money with their businesses. So I think, you know, in terms of the end consumer, this has been really, really good for them. The one, the one thing we probably haven't talked about is B2B. Um, and uh, which is always like the elephant in the room, right? Um, and so we work with both B2C and B2B brands. Um, but there's a, I've got a couple of uh, B2B brands that literally just went, you know, I didn't speak to them for two months. <laughs> They're like, just leave me alone. I don't ever want to talk to you for the next two months, you know. Um, but suddenly the, the, you know, the, the light has been switched back on and some of the stuff we're talking to them about um, over the next month or so uh, has, is really, really exciting. Um, I think, you know, we've only really been talking about necessarily like the B2C side, but B2B, you know, the, um, I think it's, there's a, there's a groundswell of, you know, sort of green shoots that are starting to appear, I think, in terms of brands are actually thinking about how can they go back out to market. You know, like Catherine said, some of them might not be there now. You know, the ones, you know, there may be some uh, businesses that were there three or four months ago and they're, they're just not there now. Um, and so there's opportunities for those guys. and it's it's still these are still people you, you don't have to change how you how you market when it's b2b you know it's these are still people um uh, you know they they still have wants needs desires hopes dreams um you know, so i think there's a real opportunity for b2b brands to uh, to get out into the market and say something uh, and and grab and go and go and grab you know go and grab some new customers We've definitely seen at CityWire, I mean, we're obviously a small company, but we've seen that in many ways it's leveled the playing field for a lot mm -hmm. of uh, other asset managers who wouldn't necessarily, you know, be able to have the, as much travel because they wouldn't be, at, you know, they're smaller firms based in other yeah. countries. And this gives them the opportunity because virtual or this type of interaction that we're even doing now becomes... Um, you know, easier for everyone and more acceptable for people to do rather than the sort of face-to-face -face things. We'd actually seen one sort of moving on, one of the uh, last week we saw an investment company have to deal with a, a video of an employee uh, which went viral globally and it wasn't necessarily the best messaging that that firm <laughs> wanted to deal with. Um, um, in your experience, I mean, maybe start with you, Katrina, because you've mentioned sort of these up and coming things you've had going recently, what's the best course of action for something like this, especially if it's of a sensitive nature? Oh, I mean, yeah, I think it's a tricky one. Um, you know, I mean, we have lots of, um, do you know what? Come back to me. I'm just thinking. Sorry, I'm just thinking. <laughs> no, no, a good no, example. Okay. Come back to me. No Sorry. Worries. I think it's, you know we've seen a lot of it in in the recent days of all the sort of protests in America as well, and and people, uh, you know, all sorts of sports teams and famous people and brands even coming out and saying that we're completely, you know, with the problems happening in the states. So probably that's a bit more relevant today than the sort of investment company last week. But I, I guess more and more we're seeing brands coming out and giving that message. Catherine, how about you? Do you do you see a uh, best course of action if things go out of a sensitive nature? I think people are more used to it now than they used to be. You know, I think everybody accepts that everybody's human. Um, I think it's a difficult one for companies because, you know, certainly anybody from millennials onwards are really concerned about what the company they're buying from stands for, what they support, what their beliefs are. 
Um, so if you take any employee to be there, you know, if you take their opinion to be that of the companies, then, you know, they, they stand to do, you know, a lot of damage by, by having the wrong kind of thing go out. Um, I think some companies play it well. I mean, I'm just trying to think, you know, there's been some hilarious times on uh, Twitter, I think, when people like Tesco's and McVitie's have accidentally tweeted something where the, com the employee thought it was them and it went out as the company, but it ended up being, you know, quite a good joke. So, uh, you know, that the best marketers would be able to take a terrible situation and, and turn it around into something good. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to take it one step further than that, I think some of the, some of the, I mean, I'm no crisis comms person, but you know, just from a, uh, from a comms point of view and from a marketing ad point of view, um, speed is always going to be critical. Empathy for the public mood. That's always going to be critical. Showing that you're real and not like some robot brand probably is, is also going to do it. And then being uh, true to your, to your values that you, you know, espouse, you know, so like the, the, if we cast our mind back two months when Richard Branson was getting um, slated in the press for um, saying that he was going to put all of the Virgin Atlantic staff or not all, you know, a, a good chunk of the Virgin Atlantic staff. Um, uh, I think, I don't know what he was going to do. I, think, I don't think he was even going to furlough them. Whatever he was going to do, wasn't going to be good. Um, and, uh, and people uh, held him up to account, and rightly so, because he'd spent the last 20 years saying how people were really important to and probably the, the biggest asset of uh, Virgin Atlantic, but they weren't that important um, when, it, you know, when it came down to the crunch. So I think being true to what it is you say as a business, I think is also uh, crucial because there's, there's a lot of people out there that can, that can pull you up and, and, and it's so much more connected now than it ever used to be. So mm. it's even easier to trip up. So being true you know, is, uh, is probably your best course of action. But like I say, like speed, empathy for the public mood uh, and being able to uh, hold your hands up, I would say as well, you know, if, if needed, um, just take it on the chin. And it's probably not mm. the easiest thing to do, but. Mm. It's a difficult one to even decide it how you know and we've seen it throughout brexit and then throughout elections you know most companies just decide that they're going to steer clear of of getting involved with it you know, there's just no mention of it really across anybody's social um and, and i think what's been different certainly in you know, what's been happening with america is that lots and lots of companies have decided to come out and publicly take a stand and i think that's maybe one of the first times that we've seen that um, and uh, yeah, no, you know, and again, you probably stand to win and lose customers depending on which side you decide you're, you know, d depending on what you decide you're going to tweet about, or if, even if you're not going to tweet about it, then you'll, you know, be seem to be abstaining from the conversation. So uh, it's definitely, as you say, you know, then you need to take a step back and look at the strategy as opposed to the tactics, because you don't want to just be joining in because there's a hashtag trending, you know, that would be the, the worst reason to do it. Um, and, and just think carefully about how it, it plays into your overall strategy. Yeah, I mean, um, just to add to the points made, um, you know, yeah, I think uh, the Richard Branson analogy was a good one, you know, and then um, on the opposite end of the scale, you had um, Gary Neville just being an absolute hero and you know, opening his hotels up to NHS workers and just being an absolute, not, not no furlough at all because he's a, you know, multimillionaire who can afford to, you know, that's amazing. Um, and, you know, again, um, hospitality, everyone kind of, you know, lauded him as a beacon. Um, I'd say during this period, we, ha we haven't had that much. It's been, it's been crisis to crisis, but everybody's pulled together. I feel like the only people that have been quite unkind at times or like, you know, I actually feel like, I need a uh, crisis management for being a PR because you have to constantly really be careful. Like, you know, not big journalists, I'd say, but like, you know, these kind of like quite sort of like woke, slightly irritating um, bloggers wrote quite a lot of um, articles about um, PRs and the fact that we were still sending emails going, you know, um, you know, dear so-and-so, um, hope you're keeping well in these unprecedented times. Yes, awful really annoying. Obviously, my staff are brief not to do that. You know, would you like to try this amazing delivery? You know, we can get eggs out to do it, you know, and they were quite sort of like, oh, God, you know, um, you know it's difficult because you're, you're constantly towing a line of like trying to sell something, but also trying to fit in, as you say, with the tone and the mood. Um, and yeah, there were a couple of things that made my blood boil. But I do think you have to, yeah, you have to be careful with 
with your with your tone and what well, you're there's saying. a strange juxtaposition wasn't there between like oh we really want businesses to do well and we need to support mm. British businesses but don't try and sell me anything yeah <laughs> that is so British it's so British that's yeah. a British thing <laughs> Have to wait there and if I want it I'll come to you and ask. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. If you're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So um I guess sort of moving on to that kind of um thread is um and this is open to everybody, is which companies do you think are really raising the bar with social media during the pandemic? Um and it can be across all industries. Is there any companies or institutions that you've seen um, doing stuff on social media and you thought, yeah, that is really, really good. I don't mind going first. Uh, yep. if that's okay. um, again, I've seen a bit of a step down from the people who you really would have expected something creative to come from. And I can only assume that that is due to furloughed staff, you know, in their creative and marketing departments. I think marketing spend is likely to be chopped for a lot of those companies for the rest of 2020. But what it means is they're going to have to be more creative with the spend they do have, or certainly make sure they get the return on ad spend with it. Um, I've seen, I think, kind of Silk Fred, Dancing Leopard, you know, some of the kind of fashion companies do very well in their kind of campaign, you know, it's linked up really well between their social um, and, their, and their emails. You know, I've seen a lot more thought going into emails that before just used to be, you know, kind of blanket. Um, I think they've, they've perhaps been putting a bit more thought into making those more interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, again, the people who have been really doing stories and, and bringing customers on a journey with them, for me, have all been much smaller brands and, and a lot of local ones. Yeah, just to add to that, I was going to say it's been less company for me, more influencer. Mm -hmm. um, so actually in our last AK newsletter, we were like, you know, the, the things that we're watching, the things that, you know, which influencers and which people are kind of keeping us going, um, you know, during this. And again, like a lot of the time, they're not even selling something or they might be, but it's very subtle. So like, for example, Clark and Well Boy, he's like God in our industry, you know, um, influencer, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of followers he's got you know he normally announces restaurant launches he's just been cooking throughout this whole thing and every I never even knew he could cook I thought he was just good at eating and every day <laughs> I go on I see what he's cooking and I feel kind of like inspired you know it's that kind of more subtle thing I think that's mm -hmm. that's um you know and then maybe I have gone and spent a fortune on you know Middle Eastern ingredients from some hamper he got sent but you know it's kind of been that sort of subtle marketing that's 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 really got me through <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think that many brands do it particularly well. <laughs> I don't think actually there are that many um, that many brands doing a particularly good job, like today or a year ago when it comes to social. Um, yeah, I, I think the bar's really low a lot of the time. Um, right. I think it's a shame. Uh, and it's a, it's a lack of uh, desire, lack of talent quite a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, that, I mean, that, not to bring the, <laughs> bring the conversation down, but like, <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're that good. <laughs> but that's what, ha there has been kind of an, an outbreak of, it's loads of free courses online. So all I would say to anybody who is interested in getting into this space, it's hard to hire people who are really great and who yes. know about social media. Um, and, and there's lots, I think e-marketer, digital marketing, all of them put out free courses that normally would cost several hundred pounds. So if you're at home and you still have some spare time, uh, now would definitely be the time to, to upskill yourself if you're looking to change into an industry or, um, you know, kind of change roles. I think now's yeah. a great time to, to make the most of that. Lots of people doing pay what you want as well, so you can get it for cheap. Home yeah, send me, send me your CV. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm always looking. <laughs> Good social people it's really hard yeah. yeah yeah and paul um would you say that the reason why possibly the bar's been set quite low with social across a majority of companies in the last couple of years is that perhaps they're too wary of taking a bit of a risk with what they put out on social media because you know with compliance teams and things like that they can kind of you know drag the enthusiasm back down um and, and do you think that's one of the reasons why at the moment well, yeah, I mean, compliance can do one as far as I'm concerned. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have, a, I have a daily battle, you know, with people from compliance and general counsel for various brands. I'm like, you know, I'm just not their cup of tea and that's fine. My job is to make their, their company get noticed, you know, to make them famous. It's not to toe the line. Um, the, uh, the, why is the bar really low? Uh, there's uh, way too much volume. Uh, nobody's actually trained 
Uh, there so few people are actually trained in marketing now mm -hmm. that become marketers. Uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't tell you what the four Ps are, you know. Um, and uh, it's cheap. So the barrier is really low. There's not very good, there's not that particularly good people doing it. They're not trained and it's really cheap. So they just keep on pouring more, mon more and more money into it, which means there's more and more noise, which means the, the few that are good get drowned out uh, when it comes to social. Um, people see it as uh, a one channel only. They don't see a, a marketing mix. Um, so they become addicted to it, especially when it comes to performance marketing. Um, you know, it, it needs to be, there needs to be a, a strategy in place for what you're actually trying to achieve. And then you decide on what your idea is and then you decide on what your media is. Um, and it may well be that um, you have to uh, put you, all your money into the most expensive media, or it may well be that you have to put them into the cheapest, you know, but let's not decide it needs to be the cheapest first. Um, mm -hmm. let's, let's decide what we're gonna try to achieve and come up with something that's gonna smack people in the face, probably get, <clears throat> get up the nose of compliance um, <laughs> and then decide on how you're gonna get it out to the masses. Yeah, I mean, to add to that, I don't know what you find, but generally it falls down on the analytics side. So not only is it, you know, the person whose job it is to market and get somebody to sign up or, or to undertake an action to purchase something, for example, um, but there seems to be a lack of tracking around the lifetime value on that. So it's the return yeah. on ad spend. So you might say, oh yeah, we've got 200, 2000 users, but nobody then looks back in a year and says, well, what, how, what was the quality like of those users, as you say, compared to the ones who were the most expensive. Um, and generally, as with everything, you get what you pay for. Um, yeah. So yeah, you know, there's a huge drive down on new user acquisition. Um, and, and really that's where all the focus is, as opposed to, well, what about our loyal customers? What about the customers who we already have? You know, because those people just churn and you probably end up paying to get them back again in another year. Um, so yeah, that, I think fundamentally there's, there's a downfall, not only on the, you know, market, social media marketing to get somebody in, but, but then what happens with them after that? Yeah, definitely. We've had a question come in from an, an anonymous attendee. Um, so I'll open it to the floor. Is Instagram running ahead of other social media platforms in terms of influence potential? Catherine, let's start with you on that one. Um, during the pandemic, there's actually been people dropping Instagram and moving over to Twitter. Okay. Um, there's been yeah, in a, a bit of an increase. And, and that might be just people who are in the search for, um, well, it could be two reasons, people who are in the search for news or people who actually are finding it's not helping their mental health to watch how well other people are doing <laughs> whilst they're at home. You know, it, we've already ascertained there's a massive difference if you're somebody who's in a garden and, you know, that you've got a lot of freedom compared to perhaps, you know, if, if you're stuck in a flat with children, it's going to be a very different experience. So that might be why people have moved away a little bit from, from Instagram to Twitter. Um, in, in terms of engagement, I think we still find that, you know, certainly for imagery for product, it, it does really well. Um, but probably Katrina could could inform you a bit more around uh, Instagram. It sounds like she uses it a lot more with influencers. Yeah. Katrina, over to you. <laughs> oh, you're on silent. Oh. Sorry. Instagram <laughs> is my, yeah, is our, is our god in, in food and drink. And, um, you know, Twitter, yes, um, I totally get why people are um, turning, you know, turning onto it and following the news through it. Um, I often think it's kind of middle class, middle aged men just being mean to each other. That's kind of what I say to a lot of my clients who say, oh, well, we need Twitter and um, food and drink. No, um, it's all about Instagram for us. It's so visual. Um, but, you know, what I would say, the, the last two points, it's like, yeah, this is this is one of the problems because the the sex social media is so huge and diverse and always changing you know i've spent part of this lockdown agonizing over whether i need to get on tiktok because adults seem to be gradually joining that and is that going to get me any better you know and it's all about being you know because now instagram is basically saturated like anyone starting to build an instagram account now you know okay fine yes you've got chance if you're a venue or whatever but if somebody wants to be an influencer it's pretty hard there's so many of them you know it's ridiculous so um it's about jumping on things fast but yes for now instagram rules okay anonymous um, question. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, does it not depend? I suppose it depends on what you're trying to achieve as well. Yeah, um, you know, if you're food, if you're food and drink, uh, like Katrina says, then yeah, like Instagram is 100% yeah. the right. It is always going to um, compete. But you know, if you're selling asset management, then I would imagine LinkedIn is probably going to compete. Um, you know, on a you know, I don't want to like dumb down on asset management people, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> 
but like you know they're probably gonna uh linkedin is probably going to be a, a more effective channel than um than instagram you know i'm just sort of uh, ballparking, but i reckon it probably is going to be Definitely. um but then you know it all comes down to it all comes down to creativity uh, i know i'm going to keep going back to it but like if you if you're going to just if you've got a shit idea, it doesn't matter what you put it on. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, you know. And you've probably found with LinkedIn, I mean, you know, just the number of requests I get every day. And as soon as I connect, sure enough, there's some outsourcing being offered or virtual assistant being offered. And, and yeah, you know, the, the people still who are even engaging on LinkedIn and it didn't used to be thought of as a social platform. The people who are engaging, the people who are just film, filming themselves walking down the street talking about, you know, how the day's been, what their struggles are, how they've overcome them. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, I, I think personality basically, people want to know there's a person behind every brand and every company. One of my friends is using LinkedIn as a dating tool. I'm sure that's not what it was intended for. <laughs> <laughs> and how are they getting on with that? Is it working out? <laughs> um, <laughs> he told me that she hadn't responded to his last two messages. I was like, yeah, I think she uses that for a professional tool rather than, you know, to be stalked by you. But anyway, yeah. it's quite funny. <laughs> I don't think we've got any more questions so I guess um, to kind of wrap it up does, uh, if each of you could kind of give um, either a thought on sort of social media moving forward after the pandemic that would be great um, Paul if I can start with you um, I'm going to carry on bagging on what I've been saying like make it part of your general mix don't don't do it because it's cheap do it because it's actually there's a reason to be using it as a channel. Um, invest in your strategy and your creativity. That will uh, have a far better or have a far bigger impact on the jump that you can make than choosing one channel over another. Um, and then look for some bargains. There's some massive bargains out there. Don't just look at social. Look at social accompanied with some TV or some outdoor or some radio podcast um, or some national print. You know something. Uh, some of these are so cheap right now. Um, you'd be amazed. Brilliant. And Catherine? Um, I would echo uh, Paul's idea around, you know, making it part of the entire journey. I mean, what we, we generally see works for us is to use social media actually to get, get a lead and then to market to them with email. So email still has a huge return on yep. ad spend, huge ROI, I think something like 42 times return. If you've got a, a way of speaking direct to the customer, it's not all of a sudden lost in a news feed and you're not competing for the eyeballs in another way. You know, people scroll through their inbox the same way that they scroll um, through social media and it's a way you can speak directly to them. So I would say, you know, for people to really focus on, on their email marketing. Um, and, and it's not that difficult and, and to bring some personality into it, I think it could be really tempting to try and be perfect, try and make a really great ad or a video, but I would say it's more important to get something out there and, and to, to have a conversation with your audience rather than just kind of a one-way shouting conversation with them. Brilliant. And Katrina? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm just sort of, um, you know, as I said, the major plus for us all to come out of this in, that in my sector has been, um, you know, we've all pulled together. So yes, try and differentiate, but tap into your community. Um, I think the ones that have been really successful um, you know, during this crisis have been people who've somehow found that voice for hospitality without being, you know, pretentious or, you know, daring to speak for people and just being totally authentic. And also make sure your photos are good. It really, you know, there's no excuse for it now. You're all at home, you've got time, you're not at work. Brilliant. Phil, have you got anything you want to add? No, I think that's quite interesting to hear about email marketing for a lot of our clients in asset yeah. management, we're seeing a big, um, use of that uh, of people being able to target them and i don't want to go too much on about city wire products uh, so uh, everybody who's listening knows what they are hopefully brilliant well, are you guys I... using sms at all just sorry off the back of that if you're if you're doing a lot of email are you doing anything with sms well a city wire oh. um probably we're doing a lot of uh, whatsapping between every single department in the company but i don't know <laughs> if we're we're doing so much. I think the dreaded compliance gets so much involved in asset mm -hmm. management that um, there's one Italian sort of insurance giant that I used to know that would send a lot of their stuff via WhatsApp uh, for their internal sort of promotion of funds. Um, but that got shut down when they got bought by Facebook. So, um, you know, there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, things going on, but we, 
we do find, I mean, obviously I work for CityWire, but we do find from a lot of our clients at Asset Management that they struggle a lot with compliance because it's mm -hmm. financial advice that it comes yeah. down to and there's something to lose rather than just the sort of straight out B to C of buying something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, yes and no. I mean, I, like I have to, you know, I, um, like I say, I mean, I don't get on with compliance people, right? Um, but uh, just because a compliance says no doesn't mean no. Right? Oh, no, you know, I, totally, and, totally. and uh, you know, there are ways. There are ways to <laughs> sell messages. You know, to, to to write messages to sell products and services that are compliant, that are still fun, and do the job. You don't have to be boring just because, like, you know, noddy know it all in the compliance department says no. Like, you know, that's not like that. It's not like a blanket rule. No, no, I agree, I agree with that. But I think one of the things that probably some asset managers, if not all, have done in the past is sort of go ahead and do something and then tell compliance. And maybe they're getting to the point where they're seeing compliance as a partner and they say, look, this is what we want to say. And we want to know what we can actually say at the beginning rather than coming to you with a complete product and then everybody getting annoyed that we can't do it. Yeah. So I guess it's, that's about better communication, which is the same. Um, you know, across the board. I mean, I'm yeah. writing, we're, we're writing a, a TV ad right now for a finance um, product. Um, so, you know, compliance is all over me. Um, and I've taken the view of, well, I might as well be up front and, you know, and they seem like a, a, a decent, you know, we've worked with them a couple of times, but compliance, this is the first time we've really got involved in their, in their finance product. Um, and they're switched on. They understand how marketing works. They're not, a, they're not the department of no. Um, so they are much better by by doing that. But I could have been elusive and just kind of got the ad out there, and uh, and then they have, you know, then they then they come after me. In any in any scenario, nobody likes to be told this is what we're doing and we're ignoring everything you say. You know, nobody likes that. Even if you do that in the end, I guess it's the art of diplomacy, right? That's yeah. uh, the struggle. I think we should start a compliance timeout social media viral campaign. <laughs> yeah. Work on a hashtag, guys. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, compliance timeout hashtag. Yeah, brilliant. Well, um, has uh, we haven't got any other questions from the audience, so I guess it just leaves us to say thank you all for joining us today. It's been a really great conversation, um, really honest and you know really forthright. And um, we'll be there'll be a recording of this, so for anyone who's joined late, um, you can you'll receive a recording of this. And um, thank you all for your time. And um, I guess for me, I just had to say, keep doing social.